All right, we are in Romans chapter number 11 tonight. And the title of the sermon is simply this. It's a survey of Romans 11, or I can just title it the Israel of God, the Israel of God. Now, look down at your Bibles at Romans chapter 11 and verse number one. It says, I say, then hath God cast away his people, God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham and of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, before we get into the actual chapter in and of itself, let me start off by giving a bit of an introduction of what I'm referring to here. Now, we as a church, we hold to the doctrine of what's called replacement theology, right? And what that simply means is that we believe, according to the Bible, that believers, not the church, because the church doesn't exist, local churches exist, but we as believers have replaced the nation of Israel as being God's chosen people. In the Old Testament, the physical nation of Israel was the elect, they were the elect, they were God's chosen people, the physical nation in and of itself. But at the death of Christ, the Bible tells us that he hath broken down the middle wall partition between us and of twain have made one new man. And in fact, the Bible also tells us in the Gospels that Jesus Christ said unto them that he basically has cast them away. The Bible says that he took the kingdom from them and gave it to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Now, what nation does that consist of? Well, it doesn't consist of Europe. It doesn't consist of Africa. It doesn't consist of America for sure. You know, what nation is this referring to? Well, it's a nation made up of believers, okay? So the change that we see there, the transformation that we see there from Old to New Testament is that now this nation is made up of just believers, whether you're black, white, Hispanic, you know, Asian, no matter what race you're a part of, you can be part of that nation. And in fact, the Bible also tells us that we are that chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that we should show forth the praises of him who hath called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And in fact, in that same chapter, it tells us that this is a spiritual house. So just as in the Old Testament, you had the priesthood made up of those who are of Israel, physical nation, but not just of Israel, of the house of what? Aaron, the tribe of Levi, and the New Testament, it's not like that anymore. Now it's a spiritual house, not someone of Levi, not someone of the house of Aaron, but of the house of God, okay? And so this concept and this doctrine is taught very distinctly, very clearly throughout the New Testament. This is a major theme that we see in the New Testament. It's very clear. You read throughout the New Testament, whether it's in the Gospels, the Epistles of Paul, you'll constantly run into this, but specifically you will run into it a lot in the book of Romans, okay? And partly, I was thinking about this, why is it that, we, that, that the Apostle Paul covers this subject so thoroughly in the book of Romans? Why do you see it in Romans 2? Why do you see it in Romans 3, 4, 9, 10, and 11? Why is it we constantly see it? Well, if you remember, Rome was that empire that ruled over the Jews, right? But then you have people who are Romans who are now getting saved. But yet you still have Judaism very much prevalent throughout this time. And you know what? Judaism teaches racism against everyone else. They, they teach that they're better than everyone else. And so Paul is writing to the Romans telling them, hey, I know, they're, 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 you know they, they claim to be a Jew, but they're not. In fact, though you're a Roman, you're more Jew than them. Okay, we see that in Romans chapter number two. But here's the thing. In spite of all the insurmountable evidence that we see in the New Testament, that the Jews are not God's chosen people, you still have people today that will say, they'll, they'll hold on to that last bit of hope, right? And, you know, you'll have clear scriptures in Ephesians 2, in the book of Galatians, the book of Hebrews, and it's just like God just constantly telling us this, but yet you still have Christians who will say, well, hold on a second, Romans eleven twenty six 26 says, all Israel shall be saved. So look, they're willing to even admit, yeah, the Jews are going to hell for sure. They're not Christians. They don't believe on Christ. Yes, he came into his own, his own received them not. But God still has a plan for them. And that plan is that in his third coming, in his third coming, they're going to look upon him when he comes on his white horse, you know, they're going to cry out, Oy vey, and trust Christ as their Savior. You know, that, that's it. And in fact, they think that God has dedicated an entire seven-year period just for them. You know, the time of Jacob's trouble, okay? It's your fault, you know, but this is false. Okay. This is a false doctrine 
And this is something that we constantly have to teach, constantly have to reinforce, because there's people in our church who obviously may believe in replacement theology, but they may not know what to do with Romans 11. And people like to go to Romans 11 to, to, to try to prove that the Jews are God's chosen people. But actually, Romans 11 is the most damning chapter, right. in my opinion, to this whole false doctrine of Zionism. Now, go back to Romans chapter number 10. Look at verse number 17. Of course, we're talking about the gospel here. And the gospel is being thoroughly covered in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, all the way up until verse 17. <clears throat> Look at verse uh, 17. It says, So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their word into the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke, them, provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. And by a foolish nation, I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. Now, this is quoted from Isaiah chapter 65. And in Isaiah 65 verses 1 through 5, Isaiah is actually specifically saying this is a rebellious people. And why are they rebellious? Well, if you go back and read Isaiah 65, you see that they were serving a false god. Now, if they're serving a false god, can we say that they're serving the true and living god? No. If they're serving a false God, what are they guilty of? Idolatry. If they're serving a false God, they're serving devils. They're not serving the true God. Therefore, they're not God's people. Whose people are they? Oh, you know, the devil. And that's actually reiterated in John chapter 8. Ye are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father will ye do. Okay. Verse 21 says, But to Israel he saith, All the day long I have stretched forth my hands, unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Now, dispensationalists, dipsticks, and even those who maybe don't adhere to the full-blown re retardation of dispensationalism, will take you to verse 1 and says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid! And just, that's it. <laughs> you know? God hath not cast away his people. God forbid! And they just completely ignore everything else. We need to read everything, Amen. I say then, had God cast away Israel? Is that what it says? No, it actually says his people. Because here's the thing. God did cast away Israel. He just didn't cast away his people. Now, how do you know that? Look at verse 15. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world. So do we see a contradiction here? Is there a contradiction because he's saying he's casting them away and then in verse number one he says he did not cast them away? No, what he's saying is that he hath not cast away his people who are saved people. Amen. You see, one thing we have to understand is that in the Bible there are two Israels. There's two Israels. You know, look at, look at chapter 9. Go back to chapter 9. <clears throat> And look at verse number six, not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Verse seven, neither because they are the seed of Abraham, are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is they which are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good evil, uh, good or evil, excuse me, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Go back to Romans chapter 11. So we see that there are two Israels. What are the two Israels? Israel according to the flesh, and then you have the Israel of God. Now, oh, that's not found in the Bible. Go to Galatians chapter 6. Verse 15 says, peace be upon the Israel of God. Amen. And look, we can't say that God has two people. That wouldn't, make, that wouldn't coincide with Romans 11, 1 and Romans 11, 15. Because in Romans 11, 1, he's telling us, I haven't cast away my people. Yet in verse 15, talking about Israel, he says that they're cast away for the reconciling of the world. So what is the only conclusion we can come to? That there are two Israels, those who are according to the flesh and those who are actually the Israel of God, okay? And it's further reinforced. Look what it says <clears throat> in verse number one. It says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. There you go. Yeah, but here's the thing. This is Paul speaking and he's saved. So there goes that argument. It actually reinforces what we believe, right? Because he's actually saved, and he's basically saying that 
people who are Israelites according to the flesh, but if they're Israelites as far as the Israel of God is concerned, God hath not cast them away. But he hath cast away those who are Israel according to the flesh. Look what it says in verse number two. God hath not cast away his people, which he what? Foreknew. Now that word should ring a bell with you, shouldn't it? Go to Romans chapter number eight. Look at Romans chapter eight. <clears throat> Romans chapter eight and verse 29, it says, for whom he did foreknow, right? He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Let me ask you a question. Are the Jews of today being conformed to the image of Jesus? No, no they're actually being conformed to the image of the Antichrist, which is another Jesus, okay? To the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he also called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. So when Romans 11 tells us that God hath not cast away his people, he's talking about those whom he foreknew, which are referring to saved people. Those whom he justified. It goes on to say, why ye not, go back to Romans 11 verse 2, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew, why ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercessions to God against Israel. Now, here's another contradiction. <laughs> because isn't, isn't Elias a part of Israel? But yet he's making the distinction between Elias, who's a saved man, and Israel. Think about that. And look, this chapter, along with the latter end of Romans chapter 10, Paul the apostle is bringing out the, the, the dream team here. <laughs> Talk about Moses, Isaiah, Elias, and we haven't even gotten to what David says. He's bringing the all-star, you know, team here, the special forces. Why? Because of the fact that the Jews, very, they're very much, they, 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 they respect these prophets. So even their own prophets, Moses especially, right? Isaiah, David, and Elias are actually against them. So tell me this, how can there be just one when you have Elias actually praying against Israel? You know, the, you have this thing amongst Zionist Christians, they're like, pray for Israel, pray for Israel. You know, I mean, you know, Elias did pray for Israel. The only difference is, is he prayed against them. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> how he maketh intercessions to God against Israel. Hey, is, Elias would not be a popular Christian or a speaker in independent fundamental Baptist churches of today. Okay, if he were to get up and behind the pulpits of the independent fundamental Baptist churches, the vast majority of them of today, they would they would think he's a, he's an anti-Semite. <laughs> like, oh, you hate Israel, and you, yeah, he he hates them so much that he actually makes intercessions against them. You know what that means? In the spirit, he's like praying against them. Look what it goes on to say, <clears throat> verse three, or saying, Lord. They have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Hmm, they have killed thy prophets. Whoa, whoa, that sounds familiar. Go to Matthew chapter 23. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 23. And look at verse 29 of Matthew chapter 23. Now, in the New Testament, you have this religion of Judaism, very prevalent. You see this all over the Gospels. And the religious leaders of Judaism are known as the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees, Sadducees, the scribes. These are people who are responsible for moving the people to reject Jesus Christ, okay? These are the spiritual leaders who reject Christ. They hate Christ. These are people who actually adhere not to the law of Moses, though they claim to. They adhere to the traditions of their fathers, right? Look at verse 29. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because he build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which kill the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Look what it says in verse 33. Ye serpents, ye chosen generation. No, actually ye generation of vipers. What's a viper? Oh, it's a snake. What does that remind you of? The serpent in Genesis chapter 3? What does that remind you of? The devil. What can we compare that with? John chapter 8. Ye are of your father the devil. See how the Bible just matches up perfectly? Yeah, it's so clear. It's so distinct. So when Elias is talking about, hey, they've killed thy prophets. In the New Testament, Jesus is preaching to their descendants of those who killed the prophets. Go back to Romans 11. Lord, they have killed thy prophets. Who? 
Israel. Lord, they have digged down thine altars. Who? Israel. Lord, I am left alone and they seek my life. Who? Israel. Look, we, need, we can't just stop at verse number one. There's some juicy stuff all over this chapter. Okay? Look what it says in verse four. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. So that very statement helps us to understand that those who are not part of that 7,000 were bowing their knees to Baal. That basically shows us that the Israel, according to the flesh, were not serving God, they were serving Baal. Therefore, they cannot be God's people if they're serving the devil, okay? Now, this is a very pivotal and important verse right here, verse four, okay? Because he says, I have reserved to myself 7,000 prophets, and that's gonna help you to understand verse 26 of all Israel being saved, okay? We'll get back to that in just a bit. Verse five, so he's saying this, look, hey, even, you know, in Elijah's day, there were 7,000 prophets who had not bowed the knee to Baal who are not part of the Israel according to the flesh, who are not rejecting God, they were not bowing the knee to Baal. And then he gives the immediate application to themselves of that day. Look what it says in verse five. Even so, even so, then at this present time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So he says, look, just as there's 7,000 prophets who had not bowed the knee to Baal back in Elijah's day, Today, there's also a remnant not a, that it's according to the election of grace. What does that mean? That they're saved. Just as Moses was saved, just as Isaiah was saved, just as Elijah was saved, there's also a remnant, not just in Elijah's day, but also even in this day as well. But is it according to the covenant? Does it say according to the covenant that I made with their fathers? No. In fact, it says according to the election of grace. Because of the fact that at this point, you have the, the, the people of God are made up of those who are according to the election of grace, those who are saved, okay? Look at verse 6. And if by grace, then there's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then there's no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Just kind of reemphasizing the fact that it's not of works. Now, why would it do that? Well, because of the fact that the Jews believe that it's by works. They believe that everlasting life was achieved by keeping the law of Moses. Oh, that's different than works. It's the same thing. Yeah. You have to work to keep the law of God. And they believed you had to keep the law of God in order to be saved. They believe you have to be circumcised in order to be saved. Okay? You know, they believe you have to be of, you know, the seed of Abraham. You have to keep the law of Moses. They would lay, you know, they, they would uh, put heavy burdens on them and they wouldn't even lift up one of their fingers. Why? Because they believed it was by works. They had this self-righteous, holier-than-thou attitude. Look at verse 7. What then? I like that. What then? <laughs> Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. This, I love this verse. It's good. Because people like to say that the Jews are the elect, and they like to put that label on the Jews for every single time that it's mentioned throughout the New Testament. You know, that's how they squirm their way around Matthew 24. You know, that gathering together his elect, referring to saved people, okay? They'll say that it's referring to the Jews, and they'll put that label to every Christ-rejecting Jew that's found in the New Testament. But there's a big problem with that. Why? Because verse 7 says that Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it. That would be a major contradiction. If the elect were Israel, how is it that Israel hath not obtained, but the election hath obtained it? Okay, what makes perfect sense is the election is referring to saved people. Okay, and it says there that the rest were blinded. The rest of Israel were blinded. Okay, look at verse 8. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. Now look what it says there. Does it say that they've given themselves a spirit of slumber? No, it says that God gave it to them. What's that called? That's called, you know, we had an entire conference this week called, you know, Make America Straight Again. And it was founded upon the doctrine of the reprobate doctrine. Okay. And what is the reprobate doctrine? It's the doctrine that teaches that God can give someone over to a reprobate mind. And what does reprobate mean? It means they're rejected 
reprobate concerning the faith. In other words, they can't believe. I, would, I don't think that God would ever do it. He just did it right there in verse 8. God hath given them a spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear unto this day. Now, is it any coincidence that in chapter 10 and verse 17, it says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And yet here in Romans chapter 11 and verse number eight, it says ears that they should not hear. Hear what? The gospel. So that they can believe by faith. Would God do that? Look at John chapter 12. Go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And look at verse 37. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. This is talking about the Jews. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes. So why is it that they could not believe? Because God hath blinded their eyes. And hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. There you go. You know, the vast majority of Jews today are reprobate. That's just it. The vast majority of the nation of Israel, individuals, I'm talking about the, the, the nation's reprobate. Yeah. We understand that. Yep. Okay, I don't think anyone can argue that. The nation is reprobate. But you know what? The vast majority of the individuals are also reprobate as well. Yep. Why? Because God has given them a spirit of slumber. Eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear, and be converted, and God can heal them because he doesn't want to save them because they had rejected him. Yep. Now, are there individual, are there pockets of people out there that can be saved that are Jews? Absolutely. You know, your watered-down Jew who's just, like, not going to the synagogue and, you know, I don't know, just is not very grounded in Judaism? Yeah, possibly. But I guarantee you the vast majority of them are reprobate. Okay. Look at verse number 9. It says of Romans 11, And David saith, Let their table be made a snare. Whose? Their table. Yeah, who's their table? Israel. You know, people get mad at us because we have these imprecatory prayers towards faggots, towards, you know, false prophets, because we want these people to die and go to hell quickly. I'm just following David's example. <laughs> Let their I'm not, I'm not even as specific as David either. <laughs> let, the, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. What is a recompense? In other words, let them reap the fruit of their doings. That's what he's saying. Let their eyes be darkened. What does that mean? Well, what we just saw in verse number eight. Darkened means so they cannot see, right? that they may not see and bow down their back always. Now, you know, we can't expound on this completely without going to Psalm 69, where this actually comes from. Because, you know, when you, when you see a New, a, a New Testament rendition or a quotation, you need to go back to get the complete meaning. Amen? Go to Psalm 69. Psalm 69. This is, this is the complete, you know, unfiltered version of what we see in the New Testament. Now, look, Paul the Apostle didn't just cut it off because he's just like, oh, this is too controversial. I can't quote it. The people knew what he was talking about because he, he, he specifically said David said this. So that means the people of that day can go back to what, see what David said and really tell us how you really feel about it, right? Look at verse number 22. Let their table become a snare before them that they which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not and make their loins continually to shake. Pour out thine indignation upon them and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate and let, not them, let none dwell in their tents. Man, for they persecute him whom thou hast smitten. Who? Jesus. So what is the recompense that David is talking about here? He's talking about the fact that they crucified Jesus. And they talked to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded 
add iniquity unto their iniquity. What, is, what does that mean to add iniquity unto their iniquity? Well, Romans 2 puts it this way. Let them, you know, the treasure of wrath unto, unto the day of wrath. Just make your damnation that much the worse, is what that's referring to. To add iniquity unto their iniquity. You know, people who have the greater sin will receive a greater condemnation. That's what he's talking about there. Add iniquity unto their iniquity and let, not, let them not come into thy righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Now, he got his prayers answered. Because when it says, let them be blotted out of the book of the living, he's actually asked, asking the Lord, let them become reprobate. Yep. Right. Because you either get your name blotted out of the book of life if you die without Christ, or if you become a reprobate before you die. So people who are reprobate actually get their names blotted out of the book of life while they're here on this earth. That's what the Bible says, that they're twice dead plucked up by the roots. Their names are blotted out. People who tamper with the word of God, they remove verses, they try to add verses. The Bible tells us that their names are blotted out of the book of life. So David is saying here, let them be reprobate. Don't let them be saved. And you know what? God answered that prayer. In fact, look at verse 19. It says, Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. Mine adversaries are all before me. Reproach hath broken my heart. I am full of heaviness, and I look for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Who is that talking about? Jesus. Now, David is the one quoting this in the Spirit, but it's basically a prophecy of Jesus Christ. So the day that he's referring to, according to Romans 11... Is Israel. Okay. So he's just caking on this condemnation upon the physical nation of Israel. Okay. Look at verse 11. Go back to Romans chapter 11. Now, a lot of people even like to quote verses 11 through 15 to kind of just kind of soften the blow. <laughs> the fact that God has just cast them away, that they're not God's chosen people. But we really got to, when you read it, you got to pay attention to what you're reading here. Look at verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. So you're saying, look, they, they didn't stumble that they should just fall. But look what it goes on to say, but rather through their fall. <laughs> so did they fall? Yes. Yeah. What he's stating here is that they didn't fall just for no reason. There is a purpose behind their fall. And what was the purpose? It says, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. So he's saying, yes, you know, they're, they're not falling just for no reason, just because God just wanted them to fall. God's not a Calvinist. You see what I'm saying? There's a purpose behind it. They rejected him. Therefore, he's going to use their fall, right, to bring salvation unto the Gentiles. Look at verse 12. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. Now, I want you to notice first that he says that they've fallen and they've been diminished. Okay. But then he talks about that their, their fullness. Now, what is their fullness? What is that referring to? Well, if you talk to the dipsticks, they're going to tell you that the fullness is when they see Christ coming on the white horse in Revelation chapter 19. And that's how they get saved. You know, all Israel shall be saved. But that's not what it is. Because when it tells us here their fullness it's basically telling us, as we saw in verse number seven, the rest were blinded. And in fact, look at verse 25. It says that blindness in part is happened to Israel. So if you have something in part, what does that mean? It means it's not full. So because there's blindness in part, that means part of Israel is not saved. Part of Israel is still reprobate. Here it's talking about the fullness of Israel, right? When all Israel shall be saved. And I'll explain what that means in just a bit. Look at verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are in my flesh and might save some of them. Well, look, Paul, he still had a heart for his, for his brethren according to the flesh. He wanted to save them, right? And in fact, we see that through the book of Acts. You know, he was even willing to disobey God. To get the Jews saved. What do you say? What do you mean by that? Because God gave the Great Commission to get out of Jerusalem. Yep. And what did Paul keep doing? He kept going back to Jerusalem. Right. He says, Go to the Gentiles. Now, given he was the one who was going to the Gentiles more than the other apostles, 
But even he had his moments throughout his three missionary trips where he would constantly go back to Jerusalem, always go back to Jerusalem and want to see them saved. Okay. Now look at verse number 15. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be? Now, I'm going to chase a rabbit here, but it's a good rabbit, okay? Verse 15 says, For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world. Now, let's talk about the reprobate doctrine real quick, okay? <clears throat> you know, like, I was talking to Pastor McMurtry, and we were talking about uh, the reprobate doctrine where we were at the airport, and... We're basically just explaining, we're, we're talking to each other about it, and just, you know, just talking doctrine about the reprobate doctrine. And we're going to Jeremiah chapter uh, 6 and just kind of just reinforcing what we believe and stuff. And he brought up this point. He said, yeah, you know, some people will even bring up, he's like, what's that verse? And basically what the verse he was referring to was, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means what I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And he was explaining how castaway, the Greek word there, is the same word for reprobate. Okay? And it is. I'm not going to argue with that. That's what it is. Okay? And, but these people who love the fags and they're just these fag hags who just, you know, they're just, these love these filthy perverts. You know, they don't want to, they, they just have this hard time understanding that people could get past the point where you can no longer be saved. And I even had a person, this idiot that I used to work with, this fool, who brought the same scripture to my attention of keeping under your body, bringing it into, to, into subjection. Lest by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now, during that time, I was not studying Greek. But he was telling me, you know, oh, in the Greek, it's reprobate. In the Greek, it's reprobate. In the Greek, it's reprobate. And I was like, you don't even know Greek. What are you talking? How do you even know that? Do you speak Greek? But later on, I thought, I found out, yeah, he's right. It does say reprobate for castaway. But here's the difference. Reprobate means what? Rejected. And the Bible defines for us through context what exactly is being rejected and what are they being rejected concerning what? So when it talks about fags, when it talks about these wicked homosexual pervert dogs and it says that they're reprobate, it actually says that they're reprobate concerning the faith. So they're rejected concerning the ability to believe. So these people want to use that against us, right? They want to use reprobate. Oh, you know, it says, lest I myself should be a reprobate and I myself should be a castaway. Okay, let's use that same definition, buddy, for castaway in verse number 15 regarding your beloved Jews. Yep. Yeah. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world. You know what that means? Your precious Jews are reprobate. Even according to you, they're cast away, they're reprobate. That's what that's referring to. Okay? What shall the receiving of them be? And look, these Christians have this, they have this weird way of studying the Bible where they only like to quote like half of the verse. That's just like their favorite part. You know, they just, they just quote the parts that they like and they don't quote anything else. You know? Because they're like, the receiving of them. They're going to be received. And then, you know, Genesis, uh, Revelation 19, when he comes on the white horse, they'll be received because they're going to always hey, Jesus Christ coming on the white horse. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? So who are the ones that are going to be received? Those who are dead. You say, what are you talking about? Oh, you know, the Jews who have died in times past, who were saved, what shall the receiving of them be? It's called the resurrection. Yeah. That shall be the receiving of them, life from the dead. And in fact, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 13, the last verse of the book of Daniel, it tells us what? It says, Daniel shall stand in the last days, he shall stand in his lot. What is that talking about? It's talking about what we see here. He shall be received life from the dead. Amen. So is he saying that he's going to receive Christ rejecting Israel? These bunch of Moloch worshiping, devil worshiping, Baal worshiping, you know, warmongers, pedophiles, Judaic observers, these Torah observant Jews? 
Come on, give me another name. I, I, give, give me something else. Oy vays. These skull cap wearing, <laughs> jerry curled sideburn. <laughs> Jews, is that who that's talking about? No, the receiving of them, them is referring to those who are already dead. <laughs> those who had died in the Old Testament who are of Israel. Not those who are Christ rejectors today. Okay. Makes sense, doesn't it? You know, if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the, be, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Those are the ones that Jesus is going to receive. Those are the ones are the ones that he's going to resurrect. The ones he's going to rapture are those who have already died. They're in Christ. And guess what? They're no longer Jew. <laughs> okay. Look at verse 16. For if the first fruits be holy... The lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. What is he saying? The tie that we have to Christ is the fact that we're saved. Yep. Okay? That's what he's saying. Look, if the branches, excuse me, if the first roots be holy, the lump is also holy. Why? Because we're attached to Christ. Good. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, I like that name, were grafted, graft in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. But who's the root? Jesus. Amen. What is it telling us there? The same thing it's telling us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 9. You know, where it talks about, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, the fact that we are in Christ, we can't boast of that. The fact that we're part of the chosen generation, we cannot boast of that. We did nothing to earn that. Okay? If any man glory, let him glory in the cross of Christ. Let him glory in the Lord. Why? Because we don't bear the root, but the root thee. Verse 19. Thou will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well. Well. That's true. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. So why were they broken off? Why did they become reprobate? Because they chose not to believe. And thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spare not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. Now, when it's referring to these branches, it's not referring to individuals. What is it referring to? Nations. And nations can be cut off. They can become reprobate just as the nation of Israel became a reprobate. Okay. Verse 23. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So we saw in verse number seven that the rest were blinded, right? Referring to Israel. And then it says in verse 25 that blindness in part is happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So this side of the millennial reign, we will never see a perfect Israel. Because blindness in part is happening to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Now, you know, I've heard the interpretation that, you know, all Israel being saved is referring to the coming of Christ, the, the first coming when he came, he died on the cross. And I don't necessarily have a problem with that. I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily believe that um, just because we see the phrase here, the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And you compare that with Revelation chapter 13, you compare it with Luke chapter 16, the times of the Gentiles. This is a time period that takes place that covers a span of three and a half years. From the rapture thereafter into the millennial reign. Okay? You say, well, how do you know that? How do you know that the fullness of the Gentiles is referring to that? Well, because of verse 26 gives us the result of the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Now look, ungodliness was not turned away from Jacob when Christ came in Bethlehem's manger. 
ungodliness was not turned away from Jacob when Jesus Christ died on the cross. Right? right? Obviously, he died, and he died for the sins of the world, but here's the thing. All Israel was not saved. Okay? In fact, when it says all Israel shall be saved, that word saved doesn't mean justified either. Sorry to break it to you. Every time the, the Bible says saved, it doesn't mean like justified. Okay? So, well, how do you know that this is not, this is not talking about salvation and justification? Well, because of the fact that you have multiple times throughout the New Testament where the word saved is being used and it's not in reference to justification. So what does it mean? Well, if you remember, I told you to remember, verse 4, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. What's another word for saved? To reserve something. Right? If I tell you, hey, I'm going to be late, save me a seat. What am I saying? Reserve me a seat. So in Elijah's day, you had 7,000 people who were saved. Amen? They were reserved. God put them aside and they were reserved because they had not bowed to the image of Baal. In Paul's time, there was a remnant who was saved. They were reserved. And you know what? In the end times during a millennial reign, all Israel, not just in part, but their fullness, right? All Israel shall be saved. All Israel shall be reserved. Because at that point, ungodliness is removed from Israel. Because what do you have Jesus doing at the beginning of the millennial reign? Those men who didn't want me to reign over them, slay them before me. You know, I want to, I want to hear someone old I have beer talk about that verse. Yeah. What does that mean, Pastor? <laughs> I just I ran into this verse. What does this verse mean? Who is he talking about, preacher? He's talking about the Jews. Yep. He's going to slay them. Go to Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6. Let's look at a couple things here, just to, just to further prove this point. Now, in the book of Jeremiah, you have Israel being given over to idolatry. And look, many generations of Israel became reprobate as a nation. You know, then he would have to start over with a new generation and they had the opportunity and the responsibility to trust the Lord and believe on the Lord as a nation, right? And look what it says here in verse number 28 of, Rome, of Jeremiah 6, excuse me. <clears throat> it says, They are all grievous revolters, walking with slanders. They are brass and iron. They're all corruptors. Referring to the nation of Israel. The bellows are burned. The lead is consumed of the fire. The founder melteth in vain. It says here, melteth in vain, for the wicked are not plucked away. So when he's talking about the founder, who is the founder? Who is that referring to? When he says the founder melteth in vain, who is that talking about? The Lord. You got you to you understand who's, who's he referring to. What is he talking about when the, when the founder melteth in vain? It's talking about the fact that God is judging Israel. He's pouring fire on them. He's allowing them to be judged. He's allowing them to be overcome by a foreign enemy. But what is he saying? The founder melteth in vain. What does this mean? He's like, it's just a waste. Why is it a waste? Well, a founder who is melting brass, gold, silver is doing it to remove the dross from the silver, from the gold. But you know what? If you cannot remove the dross... If you cannot remove the impurities, if you cannot remove the filth, guess what? The founder melteth in vain. Yep. So what happens when you melt in vain? Verse 20, verse 30. Reprobate silver shall men call them because the Lord hath rejected them. Amen. It's like, I can't, I can't take the impurities from this thing. So it's reprobate silver. It's useless. Why? Because the wicked are not plucked away. Amen. They're not being taken out. I think you're reading too much into that. Go to Proverbs 28. Proverbs chapter, or excuse me, Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25. Proverbs 28 is a good chapter too, though. You can read that later. Proverbs 25. Look at verse number four. We see this principle here. Look what it says in verse number four of Proverbs 25. Take away the dross from the silver, and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. Right? Now, look at verse number five, and let's look at it through the lens of the millennial reign. 
Take away the wicked from before the king, and his throne shall be established in righteousness. Bam. And what do we see at the millennial reign? We see ungodliness being removed from Israel. So what Israel failed to do in Jeremiah chapter 6, because the, the founder was melting in vain because the wicked were not plucked away, we see Jesus Christ succeeding in the millennial reign. Amen. So he removes the dross. So at that point, they're no longer reprobate. Amen? The nation is not reprobate. Why? Because reprobate's already removed. <laughs> ungodliness is removed. And the Bible tells us here that when you take away the wicked from before the king, King Jesus, his throne shall be established in righteousness. What does that mean? It means all Israel shall be saved. All Israel shall be reserved. All Israel will be the elect. Okay? All Israel will be there. Their fullness is at the millennial reign. This is what that's referring to. Okay? Go back to Romans chapter 11. This is good stuff. Amen? Amen. So it says here, and so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, Jesus, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. The Jews are our enemies because they want to hinder the gospel. But as touching the election, those who are saved, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Right? For the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. So what is this talking about? Well, it's referring to those who are even in Israel who have not bowed the knee to Baal, but you know what? They're not saved as of yet. They still have an opportunity to be saved. Right? The nation as a whole has become reprobate, but there are individuals, there's still individuals today that can be saved that are Jews. But it's very far, few, and in between. It doesn't happen very often. Okay? And we'll stop right there. So what is Romans chapter 11 teaching us? It's basically teaching us, you know, there's no hope, basically, for, for this nation because it's already become reprobate. You know? And Baptists just need to just humble themselves and just say, you know what? Just forget it. We're wrong. <laughs> They're done. And stop trying to use Romans 11 as your proof text because that's the most embarrassing thing that the chapter that you can use because it's so damning to their doctrine all over. Look, we got Moses has our back. Isaiah has our back. Elijah has her back, David has her back, and Paul has her back. Why? Because he, they're explaining here that the fullness, the election, the Israel of God are saved people. And these people, the fullness, when all Israel shall be saved, it's not until the millennial reign. Okay? And look, I'm okay with that. If when you talk about, you know, Israel and the Jews, and you're referring to those who are, who are dead, who are going to be in the millennial reign, amen to that. Because that's true. But don't say that the Jews are God's chosen people of today. That's a false doctrine. Amen. Okay, That's pretty much it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Uh, thank you for Romans 11. I've read it through many times throughout the years, but it's just still so powerful, still so packed in with so much truth. And thank you, Lord, that in the New Testament, uh, your people, your chosen generation, your royal priesthood, the holy nation could be made up of just believers. And thank you so much for that. And, and you know, we shouldn't boast of that. Let us glory in the, in the cross of Christ. Let us glory in the Lord. And not boast in ourselves. Because we're not bearing the root, but the root us. And I pray, God, that you'd help us to continue to learn and grow in this area. And uh, bless all there is. Bless the fellowship to follow. In Jesus' name, amen.